Are you ready for 16 channels of wearable EMG at your fingertips? I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet and joining me is Anthony Michella. He is the Vice President of Hardware at Control Labs. Welcome, Anthony. Hi, Tanya. Happy to be here. So what does Control Labs do exactly? So this is a, a truly amazing technology. I'm so excited to be a part of it. What we're building here is, is really the, the world's first consumer neural interface product. And, and the, the term neural interface connotates these ideas of these implants in your skull or, or crazy headsets. But what we're building here is really super accessible, super wearable, skin contact EMG to, to translate neural signals into useful output for a variety of control applications. So the product of the device, uh, what we're offering is really, a, it's not too dissimilar from a modern wearable. It's something that you wear on your wrist. It measures uh, 16 channels of EMG data from the surface of your skin. And our complex machine learning model takes that information and translates it into something useful. So the ultimate goal, the, the applications here, there's many, many applications, but kind of in the early stages, we can use it for things like hand state reconstruction for VR or AR. We can use it for uh, video gaming control. We can use it for uh, model and 3D modeling or productivity applications. But, but where it's going is to actually translate your intentions into meaningful output and use those intentions to, to affect, affect your world. Um, the thesis of this technology kind of comes from the idea that, you know, as a species, we've sort of taken a step back in terms of how we interact with devices. And, and you know, the, the handset is a great example. You know, you have all of this extra cognitive burden that goes into you figuring out how to use the, the soft keyboard and auto correcting, correcting the autocorrector. You know, th these, these are not cognitively simple interfaces. And, you know, we as a species have this incredible neural density, this incredible control, this incredible capacity for intention. And if there was only some way for us to use that in, in, a, more, in a more practical way for the way our, our modern, modern devices function. So if you look at the automobile as, as an example, when you're driving a car, there's a million things you need to be aware of. You need to be aware of drivers around you, you need to be aware of the steering wheel, the shifter, the pedals, the radio, all of these things, and they are become incredibly natural. Millions of people can drive cars, it is a low cognitive effort thing. But then the minute I pick up my phone to try to text someone, that's when I crash my car, right? That's the suicide mission. So um, I think with the, the growth of technology and the growth of connected devices, we as a, as a species have sort of lost that, that smooth ability to, to interact in a, in a seamless way. And by connecting that directly to the nervous system, uh, we're gonna be able to imagine these new types of interactions that people have never really been able to do before and do it in a way that that's really unique and exciting. What is, your company uses the term intention capture technology. Define what that means. When, some, when people hear the idea of neural interfaces, it's scary in a lot of ways, right? People imagine that we're, we're trying to read thoughts or decompose uh, what, what comes from the brain. Um, but I'm going to try to put this in terms of a little bit of, of, of neurophysiology here, is that, you know, in, in the body, the, really the only way we can affect the outside world is through our, our, motor, our motor nervous system, our motor cortex. And really, anything we do, any way we act, is through, through typing, through painting, through writing, through speaking, is, is all muscular signals that come out, originate at the motor cortex. And so there's a difference between me imagining some memory or imagining some things and then intending to act. And, and what our technology does is it captures that, that intention as it's on its way to action. So if you imagine the, um, the fingers in your hand, that there's this kind of complex set of, of musculature here. And the, uh, the way your motor nervous system connects to that musculature is through, through nerves and synapses that move down your forearm. And there is an incredible density of control pipes, if you will, in, in our physiology to control the complexity and dexterity of our hands. And so where we start is by capturing those signals and then transferring them into, into something that's machine readable. But I want to be very clear that it's not limited by the musculature of the body. And I think that's where our technology starts to get really, really exciting. 
So one of the examples we have in the office is the game Asteroids, the classic video game, classic shooter, right? And so you start training with it by saying, oh, this finger, my index finger is fire and my pinky finger is thrusters. And you can use it to play a video game with our technology, which is really cool. And there's a ton of applications for that space. But very quickly, you can learn to not move your finger, but think about moving your finger and effectuate those same outputs. So we do a demo where we play the video game with your hand flat on the desk, not moving at all. But the real magic and where this kind of transitions from kind of myocontrol, which is around the musculature to neurocontrol, is when you stop to associate the, I'm thinking about my finger and you move it to, I'm thinking about fire, I'm thinking about thruster, I'm thinking about my end output. So what that's going to enable is technologies like direct speech cap, direct text, direct text input via thought without any kind of motor stage. Uh, it's gonna be cursor control. All types of applications that we can't even imagine. So um, as this technology evolves, I think it's gonna set up these kind of new interface paradigms that are gonna truly change the way people interact with devices. Um, you imagine like a wearable, like a Apple Watch, which has, again, a rich pipe for output. It can show video, it can show all this text, all this information, but a very poor pipe for input. Um, the conjunction of our technology with something like that could give you this sort of new way of using ubiquitous computing by, by thought controlled or intention controlled output. What are some of the ways that you may have used machine learning and artificial intelligence to help advance this technology? One of the things that's so fascinating at this company is that it's sort of emerging from a sweet spot in a bunch of converging technologies. The, the cost of signal processing is falling. The cost of, of low power microprocessors is falling. So that enables the hardware technology. And then the availability of rich machine learning services are what enables our software technology. So we are building on this super rich ecosystem of broadly commercial technology um, in ways that has never been done before. So no one has ever applied a very sophisticated neural model to this very sophisticated machine learning tool and mapped it to really control applications. So the machine learning piece is essential to, to how this works. And as machine learning as a, as a field gets more sophisticated, we're gonna be able to leverage that to make our product work better and, and enable these new applications. Why not just use speech? Why, why use nerve sensors? So a couple of reasons. I mean, speech is, to be honest, a very low density output. There's, a lot of, there's a, not a lot of information depth through a speech channel. You know, reading, reading a book out loud takes much longer than reading it without speaking out loud. And the, the types of interaction modes from speech are, are actually quite limited. No one wants to necessarily dictate out an email or dictate out a book. Um, there, there's also things that are, don't lend themselves to speech, like cursor control or video gaming, where this sort of natural interface of, of the hand is, is a very strong kind of very strong indicator, a very strong correlation. Um, speech fails in noisy environments. It fails in, there's a lot of things I type that I don't want the guy sitting next to me to hear. So I, these are things that, uh, it's not a very practical control scheme for the world broadly. It, it has some nice applications in the home, has some nice applications in the automobile, but if I'm on a subway car, speech is useless. So. What are some of the challenges that you feel lie ahead from, the, from being able to, is it adoption? Is it the technology itself? Or, or is it maybe the human body that's the challenge that you have? The, I'll, I'll answer the last part of that first. The, the human body is, is a thing that obviously is cognitively something we associate with our ability to control, our ability to create outputs. Um, and with our technology, you could start to imagine interfaces that abstract away the body. So for perhaps there's some task where maybe an octopus tentacle would be a better controller than your hand. With our technology, you can, through intention capture, you can use an octopus tentacle as your hand. Right? So you can imagine this for robotics applications, for gaming, for other types of non new interface approaches. Um, so so the, the idea is to think bigger than the body and ultimately think about what you actually want to achieve as an actor in a, in a human computer system rather than think about the limitations of my keyboard, my mouse, my touch screen. Um, so these, I think, are gonna be a little bit of the challenges to adoption. That's why we're really excited to get a developer kit out into people's hands as quickly as possible so people can start to 
explore this space and, and play with some of the applications. I mean, this technology is very early still, and we have a, a ways to go in terms of making it easier and accessible, but uh, the stuff I see in our labs is, is shocking to me. It feels like science fiction, and it's, it's so amazing where we are, even at this early stage, uh, to think about where it's going to be in 18 months, 24 months is, is, is thrilling, it's super exciting. And you, you spoke to virtual reality, which makes an immediate use case, but what are some of your optimistic or hopeful uh, technology use cases for, for this you know, sensor technology? So when you start to break it down, the, the current set of computer interfaces are quite poor, right? My, com my phone, I interface with this, this swipe gesture and, and maybe a little bit of speech, and it's very, very limiting depending on what I want to do, right? So I, I'm, an, I'm an engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer, I work in CAD. Uh, working in a 3D model is very limiting with a keyboard and a mouse and a touch screen. So the idea of being able to move my spaces with my hands and then ultimately with my thoughts is, is very powerful and exciting. So I do imagine these, these types of interactions that are enabled by this device in a way that we haven't been able to get past with the kind of traditional HCI that, that we have of, of the modern era. But where I start to get really excited is if you think about the multimodality of it, the fact that this is a low cost wearable device that I can wear all day long and when I wake up in the morning, I can use it to control my home automation. When I get in my self-driving car, I can use it to control my car. When I get to my desk, I can use it as part of my CAD environment or my Illustrator environment or my typing environment. When I'm on the subway or on the train, I can use it for text input. When I'm home, I can use it for my home automation again. And so you, the idea of this thing that is a simple, non-intrusive, non-invasive, non-heavy, low-cost wearable that you just integrate into your day and then it kind of switches its modality around what you're working on at any given time. That is exciting to me. And that is going to generate this whole new space of interactions that are, that are very context specific, but incredibly strong. Whereas today with my handset, my phone, I have these context specific app interactions that are, that are very weak. Right? Whenever t every time I have to type something in my phone, I am taking a step back from how I want to actually interface with devices. Well, this is very exciting technology, and I'm very excited myself to see it happen and sooner versus later. If somebody wants to, maybe a developer wants to figure out how to uh, access uh, and sign up for this when it's released, how can they do that? So we are developing the hardware and software to make this a, a developer kit so that developers all over the world in every space can start to experience this technology and build their own applications. So uh, the control kit will be shipping at the end of this year. And there's a sign up on our website, controllabs, ctrl-labs.com, uh, to get on the waiting list for that, that developer kit. It will include the hardware, it will include the software, it will include an API that's cross-platform, and it will have examples in a number of development environments. So our goal here is to get this into the hands of as many people as possible so developers can start to find the applications for this game-changing technology. Well, I can't wait to use Intention Capture myself. Anthony, if somebody wants to connect with you personally, maybe they want to just find out more about your work and what you're doing, how can they do that? Uh, my email is anthony at controllabs, ctrl-labs.com, and I'm happy to communicate with anyone out there and answer whatever other questions I can. A lot Thank more information you. on our website and uh, sign up for our dev kit. Well, will do. Thanks again, Anthony. I really appreciate your time. And if you guys want to connect with me, if maybe you want to follow more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic. Or maybe you want to connect with me on my website, which is tanyahall.net. I have links to all my social channels. And if you want to chat, please follow me on Twitter at, at Tanya Hall Radio. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching.